Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans, college sports fans, wherever you want to call yourselves around, across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. And yeah, I was a little bit, uh, I don't know, slicey dicey there with that opening. But uh, Matt Wilhelm uh, didn't get to have you on last week like we had planned because something came up. And, uh, you know, welcome back. Number one to the Tim May Show is my able bodied co pilot. And we're going to do this. We're going to do this regularly in the fall. I go ahead and throw that out there for folks because I know people like to hear your uh, your uh, your your views, uh, your viewpoints on Ohio State football in in particular and uh, college football in general. But uh, welcome back to the Tim May Show. Thanks for having me, Tim. And 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 yeah, you're right. Uh, I was making my best attempt to join you in small little pockets of time when I thought it would work, but. Uh, you know, unfortunately, and, and I'll lead into it is, you know, uh, we, we lost my mother, who was a great, uh, great mom, great supporter of not only myself, but my two brothers as well. Yeah. Um, our biggest fan, our sounding board, our shoulder to cry on, even as adult men, um, because she's probably the only person that could listen and, and give you that uh, that peace of mind and also honesty that a mother can give. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, man. And, you know, I remember, you know, my mom, uh, I had I had three brothers and she was the one uh, in charge of taking us to not in charge. She put herself in charge, of taking us to, you know, baseball practice, football practice, band practice, piano lessons, whatever it was on the agenda. She's the one that would come out in the yard and throw with us when dad wasn't around, which, yeah. you know, I mean, right on down the line, moms, you know, they don't, I, you know, they get, they even have a day named after them, but so do dads, but I mean, they yeah. don't get nearly enough credit. Right, Matt? They don't. And, uh, and, and, and all that running around that she did, and you still had a warm meal, you know, yes. in between when you got home from piano or baseball or whatever, whatever practice it was. And so, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, you know, she will be missed. And, uh, but she is, she, she went peacefully and she, and we are at peace with that. And she's in a much better place than we all are here on, on planet earth. And, and, you know, uh, not anytime soon, but you know, we will see, we will, she's looking after us and we will all see her again soon. Yeah. Bless her heart, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, real quick, I want I want to get just an overall, just a general tease, because we're going to talk about the draft real quickly, because that's leading into my conversation with Albert Breer uh, about Ohio State, uh, Ohio State prospects for the for the upcoming NFL draft this week at the end of this week. Well, it starts Thursday, I guess. <laughs> but uh, middle of this week, it's funny how the draft has changed over the years. But real quick, I want to get one quick thought from you about Ohio State spring things you were able to like glean from watching maybe the spring game but just what you were hearing seeing picking up sure. on it came down you know I think one one or two times but just one quick thought that just sticks out in your head well I think the um well first of all it's an, an immensely talented football team and now that we got to see it actually you know in person and them out there doing and playing the game of football as opposed to just reading a list of names and, and attributes on a piece of paper um, but they've yet to play a football game, so we're not going to anoint them, at least not yet. Uh, but I thought uh, a few things that popped out to me is, uh, and I'm going to go defense first, is how, you know, we all, again, on paper, thought they were going to be extremely talented. They are. I think, you know, year three of the Jim Knowles system uh, with some of the guys that did come back are going to thrive and be extremely productive. And I'm sure, you know, and I L money and an opportunity to come back and maybe increase NFL draft stock value uh, in the third year of the scheme. I think that's, you know, Jack and JTT, you know, uh, uh, opposite ends of each other. Uh, you look at the defensive backfield, you, you know, an already talented defensive backfield and you add Caleb Downs, you know, the SEC freshman player of the year, <laughs> um, super productive uh, flipping over to offense. I think without being, you know, overly critical, uh, of of any quarterback uh, i thought it was you know kind of a vanilla type of football game uh a lot of hitches a lot of things thrown underneath to build confidence between in connection between wide receiver and quarterback uh, i think we took some shots down the field uh i'll you know moving from the players i think the one thing that jumped out to me uh and again i had to this is the the, the football player and football coach in me especially defensive guy i had to pause and rewind some of the offensive plays uh really digging into the creative aspect of chip kelly and what an asset he will be yeah. and uh just again the initial little you know what owed to woody hayes on the initial play was that it was that woody yeah. hayes where they like roll into position i think you know the the fly sweep to jeremiah smith uh, i think also the back shoulder fade to jeremiah smith although they didn't connect on it um 
he, of course, uh, I mean, it's probably redundant at this point, you know, pops off the page and everything he's done in practice up to this point. Yep. Um, he checks all the boxes. He just looks like a dude. Um, and to be 18 years old uh, is impressive. And I, and I think also that's what's extremely unique about Ohio State every year, but more so than anything this year is some of the best players that Jeremiah Smith and or uh, I'll say our corners and defensive backfield will see all year is who they see in practice with Emeka Buka, um, with, you know, Brandon Enos, Carnell Tate, Jeremiah Smith, and these guys are there. They're battle tested without having to line up and play an actual football game. And that will be an amazing asset. And then uh, I think my last and final takeaway was, and I don't know how much of it was sensationalized because it was, you know, the, the first uh, ever, you know, televised spring game uh, on Fox with 80,000 Buckeye fans there, which is, you know, very impressive was, how hands off Ryan day was, you know, and I know that, you know, being down in practice and, and hearing, you know, he's taking on the CEO role, he's doing the fundraising for NIL. He's, you know, the leader of men and allowing, you know, chip, why you hire a guy like chip with who's been a head coach, who's been a quarterback coach, who's been an office coordinator, who's been a play caller to do all those things and allow, you know, Ryan day to not have the headset on and be so intense. And so, uh, in the quarterback's ear and in the, you know, maybe, and again, I, you know, former, you know, in, in the running back coach's ear in game, you know, and when you're sitting in those recruiting seats, you know, you see all that player coach, coach to coach interaction about the good and bad that just happened on a specific series. So to see him, you know, kind of step back and be a little bit more relaxed. And then I think as the game went on and you get some of the twos and threes in there and you want to continue the development of some of the younger players, you saw a little bit of the fire, you know, that we see in Ryan day about getting after the, some of, some of the younger guys, whether it was a, you know, a false start or a, a missed missed block or a, uh, you know, just the dynamics that happened in a football game. You saw the the pure football coach in Ryan day still come out. So he's not yeah. all that hands off, um, but all in all, I thought it was a great day. Um, it, it, taking into account what it was, knowing that uh, everyone could just flip on cable and watch it, but also, you know, not put too much out there uh, for folks to kind of study who didn't have access to to spring yeah. practice. As I like to say, despite all the ballyhoo, it dissolved into basically a spring game. <laughs> you know, yes. and uh, yeah. because you don't, there's no way you're showing your whole hand. Number number one, number two, you don't want you you, you know, knock on wood, you want no one to limp out of the spring game. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and I thought they pretty much accomplished that. Hey, I want to ask you this real quick uh, before I lead in my my conversation with Albert Greer. Uh, Let's just jump, just jump the rail here. How important do you remember draft, the draft day, draft time being in your life as you look back on it? Do you remember having angst about, you know, whether you'd get drafted, but then past that, where you would get drafted, who was going to draft you? Do you remember what were the thoughts uh, in, in the few days leading up to the draft way back when in what, 2000 and what was that, three? Three. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's a it's a it's a very exciting time. It's a nerve wracking time. And I think, uh, you know, looking at this class with everyone besides Marvin, there's probably a range, you know, that these guys can go, you know, talking about, you know, we referenced the two linebackers, you know, Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg, probably as as high as, you know, early mid second to potentially early fourth for those guys. Yeah. Uh, but but that said, kind of like it was for me, I, I was very similar. It was, you know, Green Bay flew me in a couple of days before the draft, uh, and I was one of their top three guys, you know, based on availability uh, that they liked drafting, I think, I don't know, 27th or 28th in the first round. Um, they go with Nick Barnett, I think, out of Oregon State, um, and then a, and a series of other linebackers go. I end up, you know, I don't want to say falling to the fourth. I end up being blessed by being drafted in the fourth round, um, but it was just a range, you know, when uh, the mentality of, of football now and, and free agency and, you know, contract extensions. It's like these guys, like there are organizations that draft for development because they feel like they have the win the winning players now and they're just trying to fill some some voids. There's some other uh, mentalities where it's like we got to draft guys that we think can play, you know, in year one and, and you know, maybe uh, in trial by fire, you know, develop very quickly because we need them to be dudes sooner than later. Uh, but I think for, for these guys, you know, I think Mike Hall's a guy that, you know, can go as high as a second with a team that falls in love with you and maybe even drop into the, drop into the third uh, and be a contributing young player uh, as he, you know, 
gets a little bit of bandwidth behind him uh, by being in an NFL camp. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, got some guys bet on themselves. Uh, I can't necessarily see uh, a guy like Mayan Williams being drafted, but I think he could be a guy. I mean, and again, somebody could take a flyer on him late because, you know, a lot of late running, but, you know, running backs are a funky position now in the national football league, but I could see, you know, if he doesn't get drafted, he might take a, pro you know, he'd be a guy who might want to pick where he wants to go as an undrafted free agent and put himself into a competition, you know, maybe as a third, uh, as a third running back or to be on a practice squad where you're making a hell of a lot more money on the practice squad than you were, you know, shit in 2003 when I was, when I was playing, it was like $80,000 and now you can get an $80,000 bonus and make a, you know, rookie minimum. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very interesting, but then I also think it's, uh, you know, for Ohio state fans, and I know they've yet to play a college football game, but also looking at, you know, where some of the other guys in specific positions were being, are being drafted and, and maybe it gives a little bit more as opposed to just, you know, coming, you know, we all want to say, Hey, they, these guys all wanted to come back to beat Michigan. And these guys they all came back to get a nice, you know, healthy chunk of NIL money, but maybe there's, you know, there was some depth at positions in the draft where these guys weren't going to go where they thought they were worthy of going and would have fallen. And now they do truly have that opportunity to um, bet on themselves, play amazing on probably a top five team in the country, go to the college football playoff and continue to have that spotlight and pressure on them. And when they perform, you know, they'll still go through the combine and all the other workouts and so on, but it, they've raised their draft, st draft stock significantly. So they might've come back for, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred grand, but they've made themselves multiple millions of dollars by jumping from second round to first round or third round to second round and so on. Yeah. There was a, there wasn't that NIL cushion back in your day where you could have. No. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it was, was like, that's a nice cushion a, to land on. These scholarship, days, right? scholarship, whatever's left of a scholarship check and whatever mom and dad can throw you cash wise. <laughs> yeah, that's about exactly. it. Exactly. Hey, well, real quick, let's get to my conversation with Albert Breer, uh, an Ohio State alum, by the way. But this guy, he's still a youngish guy, at least in, in my book. Matter of fact, he was in school at Ohio State pretty much in the same time frame you were, uh, yep. Matt. And uh, it's funny how time moves on. But he made him, he made a name for himself at the NFL Network. And now, you know, with Monday Morning Quarterback, I mean, he does a, he does a tremendous job. But let's get to my conversation with Albert Breer. Uh, my annual visit, man. I look forward to my annual visit with one of my favorite people ever. Uh, the more I got to know him, the more I liked him. Uh, he went to Ohio State, but that's not the reason I like him. I like him because he's very smart, keeps up with stuff. Is he wrong occasionally? Maybe, but Albert Breer, <laughs> welcome back to the Tim May Show, my man. It's draft, it's draft time. It's time for your annual appearance. Are you excited? No, I'm excited. I'm excited to be with you, Tim. And I, I, uh, yeah, I, like I, I hope people don't hold me to what you just said when it comes to the mock draft because yeah. that'll be coming out on Wednesday or Thursday, and I cannot guarantee that I'll have more than a handful of guys correct on that one. So, uh, so yeah, that that that, that there, there might be a little bit of an exception to what you just said there on uh, on Wednesday or Thursday there on the website. Yeah, it, isn't it amazing though? Because this isn't like in, back in the old days in the backyard where people would pick teams and you would pick from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. the, the way you had your uh, neighbors figured out, you know, like uh, Richard Reynolds was the first pick on when we lived on Southmont Drive in Demopolis, Alabama. Uh, and then my brother Ben was the first pick when we lived in uh, Lufkin, Texas. And we just <laughs> went right down to pecking where everybody ended up on the same teams, you know, and no matter what. But uh, this isn't necessarily best to worst. It's best based on what teams need and stuff. And yep. so in, in regards to Buckeyes, you know, obviously, uh, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., I think everybody's heard of him. Uh, uh, as, as you and I were joking before we started, you know, the pro day uh, at Ohio State, the attendance was fairly light for NFL yeah. types because, like you pointed out, you know, you, you weren't there, but you make a lot of these, uh, at least you have in the past. But you would have only been there to watch Marvin Harrison watch other guys work out, you know? Right. <laughs> would yeah. have been an interesting dynamic. Hey, what does Marvin think of that guy, right? But uh, Marvin – we're down to the nitty gritty here. Yep. Is Marvin going to be one of the top five guys taken? What is your, what is your take right now? My guess would be he goes before between four and six. Um, you know, I think you're going to have quarterbacks in the first three slots. Um, I'm sure of it with the verse two. Like, I don't think I, 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 I mean, Chicago is obviously taking Caleb Williams. The writing's been on the wall on that for quite some time. Um, Washington has no plan to trade out. Um, they plan on taking a quarterback at two. Um, and I think like New England is close to that. Like I think New England 
would like to take a quarterback. If they don't take a quarterback there, I think it'll be a trade out with somebody else coming up to potentially get Drake May. I think the likelihood is Drake May is the third pick, whether it's to either New England or the Vikings or Giants coming up. You know, we'll see. But I think mm-hmm. that one, two, three, you're going to have quarterbacks. And then I think Marv's in play at four with Arizona. He would be a wheelhouse pick for the Cardinals general manager, Monty Austin, for, for a lot of the same reasons Paris Johnson was the pick for them last year when they moved down and then back up to get him at six overall. Yeah. Um, and the reason why, um, you know, character is really important to Monty. Um, and always has been um, in the different places that he's been from New England to Tennessee, now to Arizona um, and physical traits are too. Um, and, you know, anybody who watched Paris Johnson knows about Paris Johnson at, at Ohio state. Like he really fits that, right? Like he's a physical prototype. He's very clean character wise. He's got a very high ceiling. And I think most people would say the same about Marvin. Yeah. So I think if Arizona sticks it for Marvin will be the pick. The question is whether or not they stick it for um, and if somebody comes up to get, say, J.J. McCarthy with the fourth pick and whether that's a Minnesota, you know, a Denver, someone like that, like that could be in play. Um, fifth, I'm less certain about. Um, and that's interesting because Jim Harbaugh is there and Jim Harbaugh not only coached against Marvin, he also played with with Marvin's dad, you know, with the Colts. Um, yeah. They had a couple great years together there. So I think he'd be in play with the Chargers. But if you look at, you know, Jim Harbaugh's history. It's been that he's you know built great offensive lines everywhere that he's been, whether it's Stanford, San Francisco, Michigan, they've always been built around that offensive line group. So does Joe Alt, the big left tackle from Notre Dame, become a real consideration for them there at five? I think he would be. Gotcha. You know, so it could be Marvin, it could be Joe Alt. And if he were to slide past five, I think then six would be the floor. Um, with the Giants. I'm sitting there presuming they stay. If they stick at six, I think the Giants would take Marvin at six. So I think he winds up in one of those three places. Um, I think if there's no trade at four, I think he will be a Cardinal. I think it's a little bit more up in the air at five with the Chargers. And my guess would be um, if he falls to six, the Giants would waste no time drafting him there. By the way, I told him uh, halfway through this past season, uh, I, I wanted to get your just your take on Marvin. I told him halfway through this past season, I wanted to shook his hand one day after some interviews and stuff, and he had finished working out on the Monarch machine, which everybody mistakenly calls the jugs. But you know why that? I mean, you know, yeah, it's like well, it's Google, jugs Google, Google like, actually plays quarterback, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But yeah. anyway, I just said, I told him, I said, you know, what, what, Marvin, I want to, I just want to let you know this. I have appreciated watching you do your work and stuff, but I want to tell you, I've appreciated watching an artist at work because uh, he is so much more yeah. like a ballet guy than he is even a wide receiver, but he's a ballet guy with, I mean, his, his body control, et cetera. You know, I've covered a lot of yeah. great receivers. You, as you well know, Albert at Ohio state, but this guy's different in that realm. He's, he's a creator in the air, you know, he's a creator yeah. on the edge and stuff. And he's such a special talent that, you know, in my opinion, so much better even than his dad in this respect, you know, but uh, just what is your take on him as you've watched him develop? Yeah. You know, I, you know, and, and, you know, like obviously, you know, watching him as an alum and a fan, like, you know, I, yeah. I tell people, I'm like, as good as the other guys were, you know, as good as Garrett was and Jackson was and Olave, who I think might've been, yeah. You know, as good a college player as any of them, right? Like Terry yes. McLaurin going back a few years and what they had in Michael Thomas. And, um, you know, I go back to when I was in school, David Boston, I he's the best that I've seen. Like he's he's the best since I was in school there and I'm dating myself. But, you know, I, I got to campus 26 years ago in 1998. Um, you know, I just think he's got such a different blend of route running size um, you know, the ability to to track the ball in the air, win one on ones. It's just, I mean, I like he's very, very complete. And so, you know, and I and I tell people I, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to take shots at Kyle McCord here, but I think the quarterbacking last year probably cost him a few hundred yards, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. Um, so I think he's been the best call the best player in college football over the last two years. Um, how do NFL teams see him? I think similarly. You know, you know, if we're talking about now me doing my work and digging into it, um, you know, I I 
you know, I've talked to teams that think he's the best prospect since 2011 and maybe 2007. The significance of those years being Calvin Johnson came out in 07. Yeah. And it's just not like it's completely different level physically from almost anybody we've ever seen at that yeah. position. And then 11 was Julio and AJ Green. Yeah. And um, you, know, you hear a lot of the Malik Neighbors stuff. Um, and some teams might have Mulberry. Neighbors is a very different player. I'd say Marvin is like more of like the traditional number one receiver that we've seen over the years, the Terrell Owens, the Randy Moss, like the AJ green, like that type of receiver Julio Malik neighbors is more, you know, what I think teams are looking for in the modern era um, where I, you know, I had, I remember having this conversation where it was, um, you know, I had back to back conversations I had with scouts where one compared him to Jamar Chase and then the next compared him to Jalen Waddle. And I'm like, holy crap, those are two yeah. different players. So I tried to reconcile it talking to some more people and they're like, yeah, I can see that he's got a little bit of both in his game. So he's one of these like explosive, violent run after catch guys who he brings something that's different to the table. And some people might prefer that type of receiver in today's game. It's yeah. a little different, you know? Yeah. And so as I've sort of dug into this a little bit, um, I don't think it's an affront to Marvin um, or anybody thinking any less of Marvin. I think this just might be 2011 where you had both AJ and Julio in the same draft, you know? Yeah. And oh, by the way, the third guy, Roma Dunze, probably would be a top 10 pick in most drafts too. Yeah. You know, so it's just a, it's a special year at receiver. Um, there's good depth, but those three guys at the top are really, really good. And I think, you know, Marvin's one of these guys where you say, like, there isn't one of those that comes around every year. That's a once in every seven, eight, nine years type of guy. Yeah. And, 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 and like I was just saying, I mean, all three of those guys are, in my opinion, legit, you know. Yeah. And uh, and all three of them managed to get open when needed uh, for their football team and right on down the line. And and they're three different guys. I mean, they're three, yeah. three different kinds of players as you just delineated. Like, like I just said, the, the thing that just stood out to me is like how sometimes almost it appeared almost like effortlessly, but it wasn't effortlessly. It was like, he was like, Marvin was just, I don't know. He could just contort himself, whatever word you want to yeah, use. Yeah, I remember. So I went to the Notre Dame game this year and um, there was a catch he made on the sideline yeah. where, um, I think the ball was a little underthrown and he went up and, you know, like it was like, and I don't know if people could see it. I mean, maybe people watching on YouTube, but kind of like, you know, you know, he was facing the, he was, he, he was, he was facing the line of scrimmage and um, puts his hands up and the corners all over him. And yeah, uh, it was one of those where I was, you know, where you're, where you're sitting and I'm sitting like behind the Notre Dame sideline. Yeah. And you just see his hands go up and it's like, oh my God, did he catch that? And I swear to him, like what ran through my head was if that was anyone else, there's, I would have thought there's no way he caught it. Yeah. And I'm with you. I, I, I'd seen it so many times at that point from him that I'm like, he 100% came down with that. And of course, the replay showed that he did. Yeah. And I think there was a flag in that play too. Like, I think you know which one I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. It was just, just the, the amount of plays like that that he made um, so routinely, you know. Um, yeah. He's just a very, very complete player. And I'm with you too. Like, I think like the work ethic part of it's really important. Like the Monarch is a good, um, you know, kind of a good, like, kind of like illustration of a kid who worked in the dark by himself a lot, you know, really had a passion for it and then imbues it as an art. And I think even the way he's approached the pre-draft process a little differently where, you know, like he kind of understands, like, I've earned this, you know, I've earned the right not to worry about running a 40, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare myself to go play pro football. And a funny story, I can remember, you know, this is my first year covering the league and I was covering, I was on the Patriots beat. New England had drafted a tackle out of Oklahoma state. It was the fifth or sixth. He's a fifth or sixth rounder. And um, I'm at the rookie mini camp the next week. And um, anybody knows their offensive line coach at the time, Dante Skarnacchia, who is a legend, you know, among offensive line coaches, really tough to play for. And so, you know, that first rookie mini camp, he's testing guys and, and running them out there and running them ragged a little bit. And this offensive tackle from Oklahoma state state spends the second half of practice in the corner of the field house throwing up. And I remember ta I remember talking to him after, and um, it was sort of one of those things you learn when you cover the NFL, when you're still young, it was like, like he basically told us, he was like, I spent the last three months training for a track meet. Yeah. You know, and now I've got to kind of like retrain myself to play football again. Yeah. And I always remember that because it's like part of the whole mosaic of being a rookie is usually 
training for the combine, training to compete, run a 40, run a shuttle, you know, do the vertical jump, do the bench press, all that different stuff. And I think Marvin looked at that, and this is my understanding of it, like from having talked to people around him, Marvin looked at that and said, I don't need to do that. Like I can prepare to go play football. So when he shows up in a couple of weeks in Arizona or in Los Angeles or in New York for his first rookie mini camp, he's going to be way more prepared to hit the ground running because he's been there at Ohio state working with Mickey Marotti to get ready for his rookie year. Yeah. It's really smart. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, and there aren't a lot of kids who have the, uh, have the leverage to do it because most of the kids have to train for the testing because that's going to be part of, determining where you get drafted Differ right differentiate you from someone. but he doesn't need to do that yeah. it's all on tape with him so yeah. I, I i just think how conscientious the kid is too i'm not sure enough people have given him enough credit for being as conscientious as he was in making that decision and understanding his leverage and using his leverage um and in the end you know whether it's the cardinals the chargers the giants whoever whoever gets him is going to be thrilled Oh, yeah. Because they're going to have a kid who's ready to play football, who they don't need to get in the weight room and say, okay, like we're going to retrain you again to play football. You don't need to do any of that because of the yeah. approach he took to the pre-draft process, which I think is another example of a, of a guy who was a pro already playing college football. Yeah. What they're going to show too, when they, when they, when he gets drafted, they're, they're not going to show him running a 40 yard dash or a shuttle. They're going to show that great catch against Indiana a couple of years ago when he got his foot in bounds somehow yeah. they're going to show him like you said going high for passes uh no matter where he is on the field they're going to show him coming back into that notre dame game with a sprained ankle and making a hell of a catch over the yep. middle laying out for it you know what i mean they're going to show the highlights not him running a 40 yard dash and then on top of that i i, I posted a video uh the morning of the uh of the work of the pro day at ohio state well a video i'd taken of him earlier like a week or so earlier of him running a 40 yard dash. You know what I mean? So I <laughs> want to assure people that day that yes, Marvin Harris. They swear. Team. I mean, I know people there swear like he can run like four, three, five. Oh yeah. I'm sure you well, heard it. Right. He, he, he had a, uh, I forgot what the speed was. It was like 22.3 miles an hour or something like that yeah. in a game. And that day, you know how they have all these things they can. They so you can, know what's uh, interesting about that? He's the fastest you, guy that weekend in college football is my point. I came across this the other day, and I thought this was fascinating. I found out about a team, and a good team, like a contending team, right? Yeah. Um, that 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 stopped using 40 times. Yeah. It only uses the GPS data now, which I thought that was fascinating. Oh, you yeah. Know? And you I'm have not sure Ohio State, on. I'm not sure Ohio State runs 40s anymore. I mean, could you ever ask a guy, when's the last time you ran a 40? You know, they hard now they do, but Free draft, you know what I mean, in some respects. But go ahead, though. You're you're exactly yeah. Right. Well, no, there are some teams. I mean, and look, there's still value to it because, um, like the, uh, you know, like part a huge part of it for teams is like the data collection and right. um, it's it's being able to make apples to apples comparisons across generations, and that's why like people ask like, well, why don't they change the drills at the combine? Well if you do that, you're throwing away decades of data, you know, like, and yeah. like the value of that data is being able to have an apples to apples comparison of a guy now versus a guy in 1995 or a guy in 1983 or a guy in 2007, you're able to, you know, look at it and say, okay, I, I think this guy looks a little bit like this. And then you can go back in your files and you can say, yeah, he matches up. Like that's what a lot of the analytics departments have done. Like sure. there's one team that has like a Shazam for football players, right? Where you literally can yeah. you put the guy's name in, into the system and it spits out, this is who he is. Yeah. And here's five comps for him, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like that's what the value of it is, is like that you have this, just, um, just this, this war chest of, of, of data yeah. that stretches back decades that you're able to pull on. Um, but yeah, I mean, teams have start, certainly, you know, chosen to look at it different ways too, which is like, yeah, it's valuable to have the 40, but we put more weight into the GPS. And again, like, like over the last week, I've come across a team that doesn't use forties at all, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to go off on that tangent, but the interesting thing is like you just pointed out when you crunch the data, uh, okay, well, all right. This guy may be a slowish four, six, five, four, six guy. All right. I have really, Let's divorce ourselves from this and go. How have four six guys really done over over time? I mean, right. when you draft that body type, 
And I understand totally understand all that you know yeah and, uh, there's a there's a, a, a fred belindikoff you know i don't think yeah. he ran, you know <laughs> but to, well you don't know if you're getting a fred belindikoff till 10 years later you know oh, go ahead. i mean we can really go down a rabbit hole here oh right? yeah no that's I why think I, that, yeah. I that's why i mean i honestly think that's why like analytics has been kind of there's been a little bit of like a you know i think some friction with analytics back, yeah. coming into the nfl because a lot of nfl people would tell you we've been doing analytics forever with all this data, you yeah. know, like that they have been, you know, and like the best teams that creates guardrails, right? Like, it's like, it's the old Bill Parcells thing. It's if you continue to make exceptions, you'll wind up with a team full of them. Right. So you better have a prototype. You better have an idea of what you need at every position. You better have, you know, physical cutoffs where it's like, if we don't have, if a guy's not this, 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 and this, then he better be freaking special. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yes. for us to make an exception. Yeah. So all yeah. that stuff can be really, really interesting. Yeah. You put a bunch of exceptions together. doesn't mean you're going to have an exceptional team. That's for sure. Right. You can right. use that line if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said, Hey, uh, let's get down this rabbit hole and climb back out of it and get into the My Michael Hall. Is he the next Buckeye off your board? If you were picking uh, the, the defensive tackle opted to leave and had a great senior bowl, you know, workout. I thought he did pretty good in his pro day. Yep. Uh, just what's your take on him? Yeah, I think there's some like, you know, there are some red flags with him that the teams are going to have to sort through and the personality questions and everything else, which I, you know, I think that that's why how he did in the, in the interview room um, at the combine, how he does it on his 30 visits, that's going to be very, very important because I think anybody who's watched him play knows, you know, he's got an explosive playmaking ability as an interior defensive lineman. Um, that's hard to find. Yeah. And you see the guys who have it, who, you know, really have got, I mean, obviously Aaron Donald, and Chris Jones are the two best examples in the pros, but um, having somebody who can really be disruptive on the inside, it's hard to find guys like that. And when you have them, you hang on to them. So, um, you know, I think that there's, you know, sort of a back and forth there between like, okay, we know he's got a ton of potential, now you got to dig through with the personality stuff. Is he going to maximize his potential in the NFL? And that's what teams have to determine. My guess would be he goes somewhere on day two, probably in the second round, maybe early in the third round. So I think he would be the next one off the board. And based on his physical ability, I mean, I, I think it's talent. He's got the talent of a first rounder, you know? So yeah. um, it's just, you know, like there's just not enough. Um, there's not enough evidence of it on tape. You can find it, but there's not enough evidence of it on tape. And then you have, of course, the red flags that you have to sort through. Yeah. I told him, by the way, after his pro day, I said, you know, the two of the last three Super Bowls, the key play defensively, one was made by Aaron Donald when he got on Joe Burrow. Yep. Their last play. And then Chris Jones left unblocked. He suddenly realizes it and gets in there and forces the field goal. I think it was, uh, you know, this past Super Bowl. And you're kind of going, what? Uh, you know what I mean? It's like it was like they're running the option or something. They left this guy unblocked and they forgot he may be as good yeah. as there is. You know, so it's so I, I used to joke to the bosses. I said, you know, the funny thing is, man, you guys make two sacks a game. You've had the greatest game ever. You know that yeah. you only need that play. You know when you need that play. And then Nick Bosa said, that's right. But uh, yeah. real quickly, uh, Kate Stover. Yeah, so I think he's probably um, third, fourth. Like like somewhere in the third round or early in the fourth round. Um, not a great year for tight ends. Brock Bowers is a different type of player, not a traditional tight end. Um, I, I'd assume he winds up going somewhere in the first half of the first round. Different people have different opinions on him. Yeah, uh, I think Jatavian Sanders from Texas is probably the next guy. Um, somewhere in the second round, and then I think you're going to have a cluster of tight ends that go after that. Like I put. And I'm looking at my list here. Um, you know, Jared Wiley from TCU, Theo Johnson from Penn State, Ben Sanat from Kansas State. Like, I think Cade's right in that group, you know. So um probably, probably in the third round, if not somewhere early in the fourth round, would be my guess with him. As you look at your list there from Ohio State guys, who who jumps out next to you? I mean, you you've done a little bit, you know, that's what I like about you. You're thorough. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'd say it, the linebackers probably like I I don't know. I know before we did this, we talked, me and you talked about Matt Jones, six year guy yeah. um, as a guard. I think he gets into a camp as a free agent. He's a big dude. Let you know, Xavier that. Johnson, same thing, like probably, a, a, you know, a camp body at first. And you see if he can 
become more than that. Um, I I do think uh, um, you know Tommy Eichenberg and, and Steel Chambers go somewhere on day three um, gotcha. would be my guess. Um, now part of that is the position's been devalued. You know, an off-ball linebacker simply just. For, it's and part of it's because of you know the proliferation of nickel defenses in the NFL. They get taken off the field more. They play fewer snaps than maybe they did a generation ago. It's harder to find a guy who's a tree, true three down guy who you can leave out there. Yeah. Um. When there are three and four receivers on the field, and you know the offense is in long yardage, so my guess would be Tommy winds up going maybe a little ahead of Steel. Um. I think they both go somewhere on day three. Um, and like, as you know, like things are volatile on day three because, um, you know, Belichick said it on the Pat McAfee show the other day, like, and he's right, like how wildly varying the different draft boards are from team to team. Like people think there's just consensus across the league and there really isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, the further you get down in the draft, the more it varies, right? Like, so at the top, like, there's some variance, but maybe not as much. And then you get into the bottom half of the first round. And now all of a sudden you get to an area where your teams are out of first round grades because teams never have 32 first round grades. They might have 15 or 20, you know, yeah. so you get to the bottom of the first down round. It starts to vary some more. And then by the time you get into the third round, like, you know, one team might be picking a player who another team has like a free agent grade on. Right. Um, you know, one team might be picking a guy who's off another team's board, you know? So like, that's where it really starts to vary. And so that's why I would say day three with those two, with Eichenberg and Chambers, because, you know, like there could be a team that has a fourth round grade on one of those guys, or even a third round grade on one of those guys and doesn't have a linebacker need. So, you know what I mean? Like, so like maybe then the guy falls a bunch, you know what what I I said? Yeah. They're not picking uh, a lot of it can kind of, when you're talking about getting into day three, a lot of it can come down to circumstance, you know? And uh, so I think those two guys, like the safest bet would be to say they go somewhere on day three. Yeah. I've told many an Ohio state football player through the years. I said, you you know, to get drafted, you don't have to convince 32 teams that you're the guy. You need to convince one, you know, yeah. and they can't live without you, you and your agent. And uh, that's what they got to do. Hey, uh, before you go, Albert, I got to get, you know, I, big time Ohio State fan. Uh, I think I picked up on that because of the memorabilia behind you, uh, <laughs> yeah. et cetera. Uh, just what's your, what are you most excited about, about this team that a lot of us think is one of those teams that comes around every, every, every now and then uh, of roster, a deep roster, it's still a question who's the starting quarterback, maybe who's the starting right guard, but offensively they're pretty stacked. Uh yeah. defensively may be as good a defense as I've seen in in a in a long time here. Uh what's what is your take, your unbiased take? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't have any I don't have any unbiased takes. Yeah, I know you don't. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I like I'd say it's like the defense. You know, I I remember, and I don't know, I listened to a bunch of the different podcasts. I don't know. It might've been, you know, Doug Lay Maurice or Ari Wasserman or Doug or, uh, or Bill Landis, or maybe you guys, whoever yeah. it was, but I was listening to one of them and and somebody had mentioned when, um, when Jim Knowles got there, that it was really year three when the defense took off at Oklahoma state Yep, and that it really sort of took time because he likes to, he deals with a lot of volume and they do a lot and throwing a lot at different offenses and so it takes a while for you to build out that library and have the right guys who are capable of doing all of these different things and um i'm really excited to see where he takes the defense and especially because the group of corners again i watched I, like i was we were away this weekend on vacation i watched a you know i, I buzzed through the first half of the spring game the corners as good as the corners have been at Ohio state over the years. Like I think this has a chance to be a really special year at that particular position because of the depth there and to watch the way that they completely shut down the receivers and knowing how good the receiver group Brian Hartline has is, um, was really interesting to me. So beyond, you know, from Denzel Burke to Jordan Hancock, Davis and Igbenosin, I think look great in the spring game. Yeah. So if you're talking about a coordinator who likes to do a lot with his fronts and be aggressive and attack in different ways and give this complexity to throw this complexity at the offense, right? Yeah. 
if a guy like that has corners, if a guy like that has corners that he can trust and he can put out there and say, you got that guy, right? And you're all on your own. That can open up so many different things. Yeah. And so I'm fascinated to see how the defense looks based on the strength at corner. And um, yeah, so I think that that would be number one. And then the two running backs, I I just, you know, I, I guess the easy answer is to say Jeremiah Smith, um, who... I mean, the, the cat, some of the catches, like you see, look fake. And I'm like starting to think, is he in that Adrian Peterson category, that rare category of a guy who could play in the NFL straight out of high school? Maybe he is. Hey, um, dude, he is. That's like, really interests me because I think yeah. you saw Travion really come of age last year. I don't think many people expected him back for his senior year. And then you add the Judkins kid who, like what I've seen from him, he looks explosive and violent. Um, and then you plug them into a Chip Kelly run game. And I think that's what gets lost a lot is like people look at the different things Chip does. Like his run game has been really prolific everywhere he's been. Um, yep. You can sort of start to see the identity of a team coming together that's going to run the ball really well. And um, that isn't going to maybe isn't going to ask a ton out of its quarterback and has a chance to absolutely dominate on defense. Yeah. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, Albert Breer has no opinion on the Ohio State uh, football. <laughs> we can do a different podcast on that if you oh, want. Oh hell yeah, we'll hey, we'll, we'll do I, it. I, I, I can give you I can give you all my complaints too. Don't tip me, man. Uh, don't tip me. Hey, but real quick, I always go back to '98 when you talked about that '98 team when you were a mere freshman, and uh, if there had been a college football playoff that year, they probably would have won it. But you know, one loss took you out of it. You know what I mean? It's like I think everyone, happened. I think every starter on that defense. Um, Played in the pros. I think, I think you're think. right. Yeah. Yeah. So like Damon Moore and Gary, was it? I think it was Damon Moore and Gary Barry were the Gary safety. Barry? Yeah. Right. Uh, Cause uh, like, cause I was thinking Donnie Nicky, but no, Donnie Nicky play, played with Mike Doss after that. Yeah. So it was, it was Gary Barry. It was yeah. Donnie Nicky um, was on the 2002 championship team. Damon yeah. Moore was awesome and like had oh, yeah. to medically retire, but was starting for the Eagles, I think, a couple years after that. The corners, we're all first round picks. It was Antoine Winfield, Ahmad Plummer, right. and Nate Clements was in my class. There you go. Yeah, Diggs and Katz and Moore at linebacker. Um, who are the pass rushers on that team? No, I'm, trying I'm, I'm trying Peterson to remember. Like, but but Kenny Peterson was like, I don't know if he was. See, I've now, got now I'm I've got a hundred teams in my head. I'm 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 drawing a blank also. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, then on I, offense, David Boston, Michael Wiley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was. Rob Murphy was a really good offensive lineman for that team. Joe Germain. Joe Germain, yep. Joe Germain. Yeah. I, so I always tell people this. This is what's, what's crazy, right? So I happened to be in school in the Big Ten at the same time that Drew Brees and Tom Brady were the starters at Purdue and Michigan in 98, 99, right? Yeah. And then obviously Brees again in 2000. And my freshman year, Drew Brees and – Tom Brady starting at Michigan and Purdue. And I believe Joe Germain was the offensive player of the year in the conference and Ron Dane won the Heisman. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I there think that's right. Yeah. I, or at least Joe Germain was the first team, all big 10 quarterback over Brady and Breeze. I think. Yeah. Well, he so. was, the, yeah, he was the stud of the year at quarterback in, in the big 10, no matter what, you know? And then of course, uh, Hey, real quick yeah. before you go, you just touched on freaking Saban and that blocked punt and like, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. God. Oh yeah, and Damon Moore flipping into the end zone, getting the you know what I mean, right on down. But if the you line. look back at it, that Michigan State team had players like that oh, yeah. Michigan State team had like Plexico Burris was on that team, Julian Peterson was on that team, Cedric Irvin was a really good running back. I think Burke was their quarterback. Yeah, like that was like a Michigan State like quietly when Saban was there had horses on those teams. Yeah, yeah, but I, I always I always told people uh, I even wrote this back then they they. Finally, at the end of the third quarter, realized Plexico Burris at six foot five or whatever was one on one with Antoine Winfield, five foot eight, you know, yeah. maybe five foot nine. And they just started throwing it to him till it stuck, you know. And it's, you know, you remember the game, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, the, it, the, the block punt. And I remember, I remember walking out of that stadium and I and the punt never... that hit the Ohio State player, remember? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, it was quiet. Like, I remember the quiet, like how – and I'm a I'm an 18-year-old freshman, and I remember how freaking quiet it was walking out of that stadium. Like, yeah. you could yeah. hear a pin drop, people yeah. filing out of that place. Yeah. By the way – team, That team would have beat Tennessee that year, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, that team did beat Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. They did, yeah. I once described yeah. uh, John Cooper – 
uh john cooper's career i, I got State. pepper sprayed i got pepper sprayed on the field rushing the field i i, I will i will always remember that so yeah yeah i almost and got the, uh, and they agree and and, and, our, and and for the young kids out there they greased the goalposts yeah so i tried to jump up on the goalposts and i, I like it like there was it was legitimately greased so yeah. if you jumped up and tried to like hang on the goalpost you would fall right off Chase a grease pig, man. That's why the grease yeah. pig contest is big. It used to be big at the county fair, but uh, yeah, I always say, man, you, you talk about a you talk about a game that changed a lot of m per, m career momentum or or uh, whatever. Oh yeah, Let's think about Nick Saban, what that game meant to mix Nick Saban's career. You know what I mean? I mean, yep. and then all these Buckeyes and stuff. Uh, uh, wow, he's well, just. I mean, I mean, Coops, Coops. Um... Legacy is a lot different. Does he? Yeah. Does the next year look different? Like yeah. you know, like well, if he wins a national championship, everything looks different. You know? Yeah. 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 I mean, six yeah. and six the next year. That was the that was the year. You know, and uh, in uh, ninety eight, and wow, you know, they beat Texas A and M in the in the uh, in the Sugar Bowl, and uh, thought they might back in the back door of uh, the polls. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Back then, back in the uh, split championship days. That's right. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Didn't happen. Because if I remember right, did Tennessee play Florida State? And right. Peerless Price. Florida State come in with a loss. Was that what it was? Like, so if Ohio State, if Florida State had won, then maybe Florida State and Ohio State would have both had losses. And I, there was some like weird. Yeah. 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 I think that's and, what it was. Anyway, first year of the BCS is the main thing. At least there was so a good play. lesson for every good lesson for all the players and coaches there. You better freaking win it this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't take Michigan State. But Michigan State ruined more. Really ruined more. What like sure things for Ohio State than really Michigan has. You know, if you oh over, no, I, fifteen also. 20, yeah, I'll never yeah. forget that one either. Oh hell yeah, man! The was, windmill, the weird windmill thing he was doing. Oh my god, the yeah. biggest. And then that team. And then that team woke up. Yeah, and destroyed Michigan the next oh. week, and yeah, oh, yeah. And then Notre Dame they could have named their score against Notre Dame. Oh yeah, absolutely. That oh, one, but, that fifteen team will haunt me for a long time. Oh, I know it will. I know it will, man. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring that up. That's all right. Gentleman That's Albert right. Breer. Uh, Albert, appreciate you, and uh, let's do it again next year this same time, if not before. <laughs> absolutely absolutely hey. when, when I, 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 you're the legend here so whenever you need me you know i'm i'm, I'm good ladies and gentlemen albert breer joining the tim may show thank you albert all right thanks tim hey uh matt you heard that conversation with albert breer uh, like i said you guys were schoolmates you just didn't know it at ohio state probably but uh when you got that call do you remember when you got the call on draft day did you have call caller id did you did you see the did you see the uh, the area code? What what do you remember? What do you remember about? I remember about it like it was yesterday. Uh, we put together. Uh, I had a probably maybe I don't know twenty friends and family, and got a little private room at the uh, the Buckeye Hall of Fame Cafe, the former Buckeye Hall of Fame Cafe, yeah. and uh, that was for day one of the draft when it was first, second, and third round. Okay, didn't get drafted, so a little bit of egg on my face, but uh, still optimistic. You know, in lock and step with my agent based on what he's hearing. Uh, then the next day, you know, that 10 or 20, I'll say 20 people trickle down to like 12, which is now like more immediate friends and family. And I think we were at another restaurant down in Columbus and um, I went only like six or seven pick into the fourth round. So it really was a short lived wait at that point. Yeah. Uh, but I remember I had my my I'll call it my day to day cell phone and I got a cell phone just to give to coaches, GMs, you know, uh, my burner. agent, so on and so the forth. Burner phone. Yeah, yeah, I had a burner. I had a burner. So an 858 area code called me and I had, I had no idea what an 858 area code was, where, where it was from. Uh, but it was uh, Marty Schottenheimer and AJ Smith from the San Diego Chargers. You know, again, what they do, Hey, you want to be a charger? You ready to work? Um, and I just remember, you know, for me, it was very fulfilling because of, you know, a lot of sacrifices go into that day to get to that point. And then it was, you know, a very short lived conversation, you know, with them. And then it's just enjoying it with your, your, with your mom and dad, you know, who for me now they're both deceased, but like all their monetary and time sacrifices that parents sports parents make for their kids uh, to, you know, a just make them happy and allow them to keep shoot playing a sport, yeah. not even take professional sports, college sports into it. But for me to do, to be who I was coming out of high school and then coming out of, you know, Ohio State, winning a national championship and having them there, you know, right by my side throughout the process, I owe so much of it to their sacrifices. Um, you know, yes, my hard work, but, you know, opportunities, um, 
that presented themselves, you know, they had to be yes parents to a lot of things. And that's AAU yeah. basketball, that's travel baseball, that's football camps all over the country, you know, attempting to get recruited and so on uh, in the high school. So then it just, it was very fulfilling. And, you know, and again, a guy that I'm rooting for and I've always have been since he kind of did some diligence to the number 35 is, you know, Tommy Eichenberg, you know, from up Northeast Ohio lives in West, you know, from West Lake, same city we live in now. He was an Ignatius kid, you know, we're, you know, an Ed's family, but you, you want to see great things come out of Northeast Ohio and he's like I said, he's one thirty five. He's he's done you know done it very proudly. So I I follow him very closely, and I wish nothing but the best. And I think he's a guy who you know a team's going to get a you know tough run stuff stuffing linebacker who's smart, who works his tail off, uh, who I think and in, in time will become a three down linebacker in the National Football League. Yeah, you know what's interesting about him is you know he's about a con he would like you said he was a consummate college football player, but maybe to. To his detriment, you know, because playing with that uh, that elbow that he hurt in the year, and it really, you know, I think it still may be bothering him today. And I think it's a question mark for some of the NFL teams, you know, about him. Otherwise, they like everything they they see about him, you know. And it's uh, it's funny because they they do pick through all the remains, right? I mean, of you before yeah. the draft and find reasons, more reasons not to draft you than to draft you, right? Is that is that putting it accurately? A hundred percent. And and it's forever in a day. It's, you know, NFL, a lot of people who've been around it, you know, is considered not for long. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, and I know it's extremely cliche, but the best, you know, ability is availability. And so for a guy like Tommy, it is cliche, uh, but you're right. Yeah. Go yeah ahead. But, but yeah. I meant for like, for a guy who you think, you know, from a Buckeye lore standpoint, you know, you're going to look back as, you know, one, a, a Buckeye, a Buckeye linebacker. Great. Yeah. Um, putting, himself in the line of fire for the sake of his brothers and the university on the football field um, and wanting to play hurt and wanting to keep pushing while hurt, while, you know, it may in the long run end up hurting him um, from an NFL draft standpoint, or it could be something that's lingering that, you know, he, someone does, you know, take him at some point and then he, you know, that ends up reoccurring and it's, you know, kind of like a little bit of a ticking time bomb on his potential, you know, very, very promising NFL career. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, last thing, man. Uh, speaking of the of the NFL draft, obviously, uh, we've passed that uh, in this conversation. But I wanted to ask you for the guys who've stuck around, and you know, you you named some of them. I mean, you know, Denzel Burke returning, for example, too. Yeah. To the I'm a, my, you know Trevion Henderson teaming up with Quinshawn Judkins now as good a running back tandem as there is in the country. One two or one A one B or whatever you want to call them. Just line up, guys. Uh, but my point is this: between now and August, what what should be on these guys' minds? I mean, because like you just pointed out, it's as talented a roster as there is in college football this year. You know, in some respects, if 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 they had figured out the quarterback question in uh, in the spring and right guard, I think I you know with no hesitation, I'd vote them number one team in the country. I think there's still some question marks at both those spots, sure. which are vital. But what? What should these guys, these players, be concentrating on? Because uh, you had this vantage point from between uh, 2001 and 2002 when it all came together big time for you guys and you yeah. won the national championship. What should these guys be concentrating on the next couple of months? Well, I think if the, if the if the intention of especially those guys that came back, you know, to and they and they, you know, and I'm not I'm not making fun, but like the the, the unfinished business, you know, narrative yeah. that that all of them have collectively taken on. And we all know what that is and represents. Um, they're going to, and this is the challenge. They're going to be given time now that spring ball is over. They're, I mean, and when I say time, they're going to get some some free time, freedom, where um, you know they're going to get through school, and then they're going to have you know how many stay for summer workouts, you know how many uh, dabble in and out of town while having you know a, a condo or townhome or whatever they're living in, and then going home to see their friends. Uh, and we all know what that represents because, you know, Coach Day and, the, and their position coaches are giving them the warnings, you know, about, A, in today's landscape with cell phones and the Internet readily available to the second, um, you can be a meme, you know, really quickly, you know, if you're caught doing something you're not supposed to, which then is a black eye for everybody. Yeah. I mean, the program, the university, Coach Day, your offense coordinator, defense coordinator, your position coach, you, your group, everything, everything. It's just a trickle down effect. So I think I would expect, you know, laser focus from these guys. I think the that brotherhood that they preach 
to um, collectively with, you know, Coach Marathi in the weight room and beyond that, that's going to be a bond that they're going to want to lean, lean into and kind of just stay super focused. I hate to say that. And I know it's, you can't stay like, you know, dialed in laser focused at all times, but, but keeping your eyes on the prize and making sure that, you know, every day, week or month, you know, as an individual and as an offense and defense that you're, you're continuing to take steps forward. You're not staying the same and you're not going backwards that regression. And I think, and I think lastly, the channel, the reason why that's a challenge is because these are, you know, 18 to 22 year old, uh, 22 year olds. Right. And yeah. now, um, a heavy portion of them have been given, given some, some pocket change, you know, and some, huh. some walk around, walk around money. Yeah. You know? That's and putting so, it lightly. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you're right. But, but I mean, yeah, you like, you can take that and run with it in a million different directions, but I meant now these guys are, they're grown men. Yeah. You know, meaning like their business, they're business men, you know, and they, they're themselves or their business. Who's going to put their business and likelihood in the line of fire. And and who's just going to stay on the straight and narrow? Uh, but I think you know that brotherhood uh, and the messaging from Coach Day and his staff will be probably exactly what Buckeye fans and and you and I would want to hear, you know, to these players. And I think that a heavy portion of them are truly, you know, laser focused on a. You know, you've got some. I mean, while there's a lot of guys that are going to be great for us, there's a lot of position battles of who's going. I mean, well beyond quarterback. You know, along the offensive line, you know, who's going to challenge, you know, G. Scott for for playing time at tight end? You know, you can only play three wide receivers, four wide receivers, you know, but yet you have six, seven highly talented dudes, you know, on defense. You know, um, I know we run the four two five, but like, you know, you could play seven guys, you okay. know, um, because then I think here's the other the other challenges. And I, this is we can kick this down the road, but it, the challenge is, you know, if you're all in to beat Michigan, to win the Big Ten, to be one of the top seeds, to get the first round by in the college football playoff and win a national championship, you know, well, what's left when all these guys then leave? Yeah. And if you have a bunch of, you know, red shirt sophomores and red shirt juniors now who've had two, three years in the program, but have never cracked to start, then you're going to start, you know, 12 out of 24 dudes that have never, you know, played a significant amount of time in an Ohio state uniform and you're relying on them to, to develop. So I think that's, that's, that's the challenge is if we're that dominant, I think what coach day does in, in getting some of these younger players, you know, experience as well, because it will pay dividends. Um, a, if you get, if the injury bug in these now longer seasons uh, hit the team at any point, you don't want to have an unproven, you know, player having to step up and be the guy. Uh, and then also you always have to think, you know, while we're all in on that one thing, it's, you know, it's what these classes of, you know, the 2020 class that, you know, is all, not all coming back, you know, what do they represent? But when they're gone, what's life after those guys look like? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Opportunity. If you seize it, right. Uh, yes. That's what it's all about. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Matt Wilhelm uh, joined me again in my co-pilot seat. As you can see, he can, he can fly the plane. I just kind of like put it on auto, <laughs> auto, auto Wilhelm pilot and let it yes. uh, and let it glide, so to speak. But uh, just yeah, Matt, don't let me get into international international air. Just keep yeah. me in the domestic. Yeah, air, yeah, yeah. You don't want to get shot out in the middle of the Tim May show. <laughs> That's for damn sure. But uh, Matt, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do in the fall. You and I, man, I always enjoy having you on your expertise and and uh, you know. Uh, my heart goes out to you because you, I know you, so you and your family are dealing with a with the major loss of your mom. But uh, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, Tim. And it's it's always a pleasure. I love uh, I love Ohio State football. I lived it, and uh, and again, we've got an, an amazing opportunity in front of us this year with this squad, and uh, it should be a fun fun journey for for us to be speaking about it uh, all year long. Absolutely, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, until next week, we'll see you then. <laughs>